Okay. Do you want to try to restart? Uh, it says it's live streaming. Yeah, we'll see what the stream looks like. It could just be something weird on my on my machine. Okay, so we are live now, Joe. Okay, all right. So I'm sorry for that little technology glitch here um, to start. So uh, adequate notice has been given, and we are going to... Yeah, I'm looking at the stream. The stream is fine. But okay. I'm just we're... not seeing anyone on my end. But yeah, I'll... Okay, yeah. we're going we're gonna to go ahead and start the meeting. Um, and we're going to start with the uh, pledges we always do to uh, Sean's flag there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty. Uh, welcome, everybody. And again, sorry, we're starting a little bit late, um, but we are going to start uh, with recognizing our own. So I'm going to hand it over to Sean. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate it. So again, for everyone, recognizing our own is an opportunity for us to highlight some of the wonderful things that are happening within the district. And we always try to really try to make it student centered. Um, so tonight we are going to uh, recognize some of our, uh, our Globe writers. And, and so I want to get started by uh, recognizing first Aaron Sucker O'Grady, who is um, our Globe advisor. And um, I just want to say a few things first about Aaron before we get started by recognizing the students. And Aaron's going to share a little bit about some of the great things that have been happening with the Globe. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with Erin over these years and have had firsthand experience in seeing some of the things that she does with her students and, and with her staff of the globe. And one of the things that she does is it's not just about it's not just about the content that they put into the globe. It's not about the it's not just about the writing. It's not about how the students are able to express their opinions. Aaron is developing leaders and people who are humans that are contributing to the betterment of the world. And she is really constantly thinking about beyond just the globe itself, it's about the individual student. And I have been in workshops with her where she is develop developing the leadership abilities of our students. And what I've seen is that our students gain this tremendous sense of efficacy and they have a strong voice because of what she fosters with her students. So Aaron, thank you so much. And I want to recognize Erin because she will be recognized by the Journalism Education Association as a master journalism educator in November of 2021 uh, during their fall national conference. Um, so Erin, thank you for all that you do. And so we're going to bring in your students. And if you could talk a little bit about some of the highlights of things that are happening with the globe and some of the recognitions that we have for our students. Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Hey guys. Let them connect here for a second. Um, so on, on the call tonight, um, we have uh, essentially our um, head leadership team for this year and our incoming leadership team for, um, for next year. And um, some of the things I, I, I think, as some of you guys know, um, we've had some national recognition for the publication. Um, we were a, a National Scholastic Press Association pacemaker finalist, uh, a Columbia University Scholastic Press Association gold medalist and silver crown winners. These are kind of the top awards in, in journalism, um, scholastic journalism in the country. Um, and, and these are the students that really have been at the helm of that work. Um, and I think one of the things that's so cool about this particular school year, which is not a cool school year for most of us, but the, the globe I think has served really as a touchstone for all of us. Um, as I know as myself as an advisor, and I think the students feel similarly that this was something that when school you know, got kind of shut down at the end of the school year last year, we were like, okay, we're gonna keep making magazines and, and forge forward. And um, I know that we 
tried to make the most of enjoying our, our Zoom time together. And I think it's been a real testament to the dedication um, that the students have and the passion that they have for the globe as a collective and um, what it means to the community to just trying to keep, you know, getting out that level of quality of publication in weird, in this weird circumstance and, you know, kind of shifting gears every, you know, so often and just trying to adapt and still make the most of it. And the other thing that's really, um, I think, been so impressive to me is that, you know, as, as um, Dr. Doherty mentioned uh, at the beginning, really one of the things that's the most essential element to what we do is this community building um, and this opportunity for the students to really grow as leaders and to, and a big part of that is connecting with these young, these new reporters that are coming in. And this has been a very challenging year for them to try to do it. And they still are making it happen. Um, they're still developing those relationships. They're still, you know, I can see the spark at um, some of those, those freshmen that are starting to that globe experience for the first time. And these, these are the guys that are really um, making those, those contributions and going the extra mile to, to, to make the globe what it is, which is really a, a community that develops and fosters leadership. Erin, can you introduce who we have here tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, Sophia Erland, um, who is one of our editors in chief this year. Uh, I'm just going to go in the order that I see you guys on my on my screen here. So um, uh, Caitlin Tran, you know, she's been a senior managing uh, editor. Uh, Ella Cuno uh, is a senior managing editor. Um, she also launched the Globe podcast uh, this year, which was which has been a fun addition to what we're we're doing. Um, Angela, you want to say hello? Wave hello. Um, Angela is a senior managing editor. She's a senior, but. I would say, I, I think functions just as, as much the level of the editor in chief. I think everybody would concur that, you know, she is putting in um, her all every day and has really been um, such, I, I bet, bet all the new reporters could tell you who Angela is because she could make, you know, goes out of her way to make sure that she's making connections with those people. Um, Ivy Reed, um, who, has gotten also some individual national recognition uh, as um, second place in the nation for writer of the year and had a second place in the nation sports story of the year. Um, City uh, is our um, uh, chief digital editor and Caitlin's gonna be our chief digital editor next year. So they're in charge of running everything on the Globe website. And then Shane LeJess um, is uh, editor in chief uh, this year. Um, and we'll be next year along with Ella and Ivy. So that's kind of the, the, the crew. I'm hoping, hopefully I'm not missing anybody on the, on the second screen. Let me just make sure. Okay. <laughs> no, and thank you. Um, and I don't know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I just wanna say thank you to our Globe staff for constantly putting some thought provoking material uh, content out there, always kind of being on the cutting edge of what's happening in the world and um, and again, just always demonstrating such strong leadership abilities. And I always appreciate when I get interviewed by um, a Globe um, writer and it's just the sense of professionalism that you can feel and I just, and you set that tone. So thank you, Aaron, for being the leader of that. Absolutely, absolutely. I think maybe a couple uh, kids just wanted to say something very briefly if that's, if we have time. Yeah. And who was going to say something? I can go I, first. I think, or, uh, Ivy and Angela. Or Angela. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll start, and then Ivy can um, follow follow up. Yeah, I think what Mr. Drew Grady said was so true. For a lot of us, Globe was really gave us that sense of normalcy that we were missing this year. Um, so thank you, Mr. Drew Grady, um, for continuing to put on like fun events and stuff. It really means a lot to us. Um, and then also as I've worked, I worked on the teacher mental health story and then also this recent education story. So that's kind of just given me a newfound appreciation for the teachers and everything that the, that the district does. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you, Angela. Ivy. Yeah, just to kind of like go off that, like looking at kind of what the globe has done this year, especially like with the pandemic, um, not only I think has it brought like a sense of normalcy it's also been, at least for me and a lot of the other staff members, a way for us to kind of like collectively like process and unpack a lot of the major events that have happened this year. 
um, and a way for us to kind of like make student voices heard on like a larger scale in our community. Um, so I think like looking at a lot of our journalism this year, a lot of it has been really focused on getting student voices published. So we did, you know, an issue on mental health. We did an issue on politics where we polled the student body. Um, we did an issue on like public education, how students feel about it. Um, and so I think it's been really great that we've been able to kind of showcase student voices and student perspectives in a year where a lot is changing and a lot of us feel like there are a lot of decisions being made on both like a national and local level that are really like impacting our lives. Um, so we're so glad to have a supportive board of education and a supportive school district that allows us to publish the work that we do. Thank you guys so much. And on behalf of the board, I just want to say thank you to um, each of you, you know, Caitlin and Sophia and Ella and Angela and Ivy and City and Shane and Aaron. Um, the Globe is awesome and you guys are doing a great job. So thank you. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Thanks, guys. Keep up Thanks. the good work. <laughs> so we, we yeah, are going to go ahead and log off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you don't have to stay on. No. Um, you, Caitlin. Yeah, Caitlin, you get to stay on. <laughs> um, so we are going to move on to superintendent communications. So back to you, Sean. Thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm, tonight. I'm planning to give a few different updates, and um, and really going to be centering around you know changes for our fourth quarter, monitoring of district data, um, and vaccines update, talking about our superintendent transition plan, and and how we're moving forward. And before I get started with uh, the meat of this presentation, I want to start by um, gratitude, and and I truly, firmly, firmly believe that gratitude is something that um, is a skill you have to content continually practice. And I just wanna take um, a moment to uh, say thank you to so many different people. And, and, I, and, I, and the reason why I wanna think about this is that this past week we had spring break. And I was thinking about all the work we were doing last spring break to um, administer devices to people and get a whole new learning platform started. And how a year now, after a year, we were now administering vaccines during spring break and versus devices and, and how so much has changed. And we've had to make a lot of difficult decisions over this year. And we've had to change the learning models uh, several different times and we've had to evolve and we've had to pivot in a couple different ways. And I just am very grateful for all of the, the teachers, the administrators, the support staff, um, our students and parents and in the board of education and your support throughout this year um, we would not be where we are today. And today we started a new learning model and it was like the first day of school again today. And um, we had, I was very grateful we had those two remote days so that way we can do some contact tracing um, on Monday and Tuesday, but we started the fourth quarter on Monday. And today we started extended uh, learning for our, for Wydown and for uh, the high school and more students came back into the school at the elementary level. And um, it was it was a really it felt really positive today um, and felt really positive about all the work that was put in place to make that happen. Um, we've had to look at changing schedules. We've had to look at um, thinking about uh, transportation. We've had to think about um, learning models. We've had to think about technology and so much work has gone into place to make the start of the fourth quarter a success and you know today is day one with being in with all the students at once but I felt overall it's been very successful and um, and I I assure you that we were going to work to finish this school year very strong and believe that this work that we are been, have been doing has been leading us up to a point where we are going to be in full session with our students in the fall uh, as much as, you know, and, and unless something else happens and we're hoping nothing else happens and no variants are going to deter that, but we are um, feeling very confident about the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, and I just think about how creative people have been. And Jamie Jordan sent me a video today and I got to go see it firsthand of how 
our parking garage at White Island is now the Park Place Bistro where our students are eating outside and just trying to think to ways to differently support our students to keep them there for longer periods of time. And we were able to do that. We were able to extend that because we were able to monitor data and the data showing that we are having, there is very, very low tr transmission, almost none within our schools. Our risk mitigation measures are working and that has made us feel very confident about making these decisions to move forward. I did also wanna share with you just the data in terms of what, how many students are back in school uh, for learning at home and how many students are still, excuse me, for responsive learning and how many students are still learning at home. And you can see that we have um, 2,073 students that are in responsive learning, meaning throughout the entire district. And then we have 431 students who are still learning at home. And what that says to me is that uh, I'm very proud of those numbers because those have increased, resp responsive learning students have increased throughout the years. We changed the learning models, um, but also people are feeling good about the quality of education we're providing for our learning at home model as well. Um, and so just wanted you to see the numbers of where we are currently. And right now, this, these should stay pretty solid for the rest of this semester, excuse me, for the rest of this quarter. Um, as I shared with you that um, last week, we did a vaccination clinic for our staff. Um, we were able to extend that to their family members as well because we had some additional slots. And it was great that we had close to 470 people that came to Clayton High School last week and were able to get vaccinated. And um, many of our staff were able to get vaccinated. And, um, and I know that our staff is, was working diligently even before we had that vaccination clinic to look for ways to get vaccinated. And so i um, feeling very confident about that. The vaccination is not the end all be all solution, but it is another layer of protection, which I, feel I, help, I think helps build confidence within our schools. The thing that we're now looking at is that now that we're finding the research that students um, could be potentially vaccinated, we're gonna try to be as proactive as possible and seeing if Clayton can be a mechanism for distributing those vaccinations for students in the future when those, that, that tier opens. The other thing is that now that we're moving forward, um, I'm proud that we've been able to continue other initiatives and other programming and, and things that are connected to our strategic plan that are beyond COVID. And so um, we're looking at what we learned from this experience and thinking about how it's potentially gonna influence our schedules for next year, how we use technology, um, and different learning models. And I, and I think that we have to take it as an opportunity for learning and opportunity to grow. And I think that what we've learned about ourselves this year um, will influence how we move forward in the future. And I think that I often hear people say that, you know, we're, we're, um, we're looking for, this is the new normal. And I, I heard recently that, um, you know, moving out of going back to what we think is normal, like we don't want just normal. We wanna make sure that we are thinking differently about how we're remaking tomorrow. And I love that phrase that, you know, we're kind of thinking about how we remake tomorrow and, and how we think differently. Um, I will say that tonight's, Tonight's agenda is going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to hear about technology and how um, we how that's been moving forward and how how our plan has been influenced by what we've had experienced over this last year. We're going to learn a little bit about assessment and how our students are performing. We're going to talk about enrollment. And then also we are going to be presenting some staffing recommendations because, as I said, we're not so focused all on COVID, but like what other programming and what other innovations can we put in place that is going to better reach our students. And, um, and, I, and I think that we, when we're thinking about our, what we've done throughout this year and what we're thinking about doing for the future, we're not gonna compromise our excellence. We're not gonna lower standards. We're not going to um, you know, just settle. We're always gonna continue to think about how we can be the very best for our students. And so we, we say that we wanna strive to be transformational. And I think that we are continuing to be that school district that is transformational. Um, so I um, so I also just wanna update you is that I continue to meet on a weekly basis with uh, Dr. Patel, and we continue to talk about plans, not only for the rest of this school year in terms of her, her connections to people in the community, but we're also talking about like ways that I can support her in looking at our strategic plan and then her plans for development of the, the, the leadership team 
uh, and then making sure that we're thinking about what we're going to do this summer. And so um, I'm continuing to support her through that. So um, that is the end of my report. And I was going to turn it over to Caitlin to see if she wants to provide any additional updates. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So I'll start off my update with back to school. So we had the first day of the combined morning and afternoon session of school today in person. Um, and I'll touch more on student opinion regarding the new schedule in future updates. Uh, but just right off the bat, I noticed that teachers are having students engage in a lot more group work than we have in the past and a lot more discussion uh, with having a larger class. Uh, and next, I did want to address the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes happening in the U.S. Um, so as an Asian student, I wanted to make a statement on the rise. Um, so anti-Asian hate has been rising due to COVID-19, not just now, but it has been happening for the past year. Uh, this issue is also historic from the, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act to Japanese internment camps. So during this time, I just really want to emphasize the importance of being there for other Clayton Asian community members, uh, parents, staff, um, and students during this time. I know Asian-owned businesses and restaurants especially have taken a hit during COVID-19, so I would implore you all to shop at these businesses and show your support for them. I would also encourage donating to any GoFundMes for victims. I know a lot of uh, victims of hate crimes are having GoFundMes to pay for their personal injury costs or their lawsuit costs. And I would also encourage actively being a bystander and denouncing any hate speech that you hear, which has been going on against the Asian community for the past year. Um, and I think mental health is like very important, especially for our communities. Uh, so being able to listen and provide a uh, voice for Asian members uh, to be able to speak out and for the Asian members of the community that may be listening to this, uh, taking care of yourself um, and indulging in self-care and reaching out if you need any support. Uh, specifically with what happened with Atlanta, like service workers are especially affected. So I just want to encourage any Asian service workers to take that time for yourself during this time. Um, and also, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the administration has been there for Asian students. So I've had conversations with Dr. Weens about how we can provide support uh, for students at this time and just in general. And Dr. Weens held an Asian affinity group meeting after Atlanta, and I think this chance for students to feel heard was very important and for students to be able to sort through their thoughts along with other students who have been experiencing uh, similar things and having similar sentiments. Uh, so I want to thank Dr. Weens for spearheading a lot of these efforts that have been supporting Asian students. And as an Asian student, to be reached out to by an Asian administrator uh, made me feel heard and was um, a very helpful for Asian students. Um, and I want to also thank Mr. Poole for setting up the student conversation panels um, and the Asian student panel is happening next week. So I think uh, that is especially important so that students from diverse backgrounds have the opportunity to share what's on their minds with the rising hate crimes. Um, and as for some announcements, Quiz Bowl competition is this weekend, Mock Trial State competition is next weekend, and Science Olympiad Regionals is next weekend. So there are a couple more competitions that clubs are having during fourth quarter. Thanks, Caitlin, uh, and thanks, uh, Sean, for those updates, appreciate it. So um, we're gonna move into our information items and um, we actually have three information items that are kind of robust and we're, we're calling them information items, but I do promise I will give you uh, um, each board members an opportunity to um, ask questions if you want. So the first one up is uh, 5.01, which is a technology self-study for year one. And Jeff and Malena, this is yours. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the district is currently in year one of a two-year self-study of technology, and we're using a similar process to what you've seen for uh, the curricular areas that are currently in review. Um, as a result, we provided the board with a written report, which provides some historical background, uh, some information about progress toward uh, the previous goals that we had, 
and a summary of next steps as part of the two-year self-study. Uh, in addition, though, to that report, Dr. Garganigo and I will be presenting some highlights uh, this evening to help provide more context about the technology changes that have happened, uh, happened in the district over the last few years, along with a brief summary of the district's technology response to the pandemic and what we've learned as a result. So while the main purpose of this presentation tonight is to be informational for the board, uh, we'll be recording questions you might have at the end to help guide future work. So educational author, George Kuros, which many of you may have heard of before, um, has said that technology is not just a tool. It can give learners a voice that they may not have had before. Uh, this sentiment is reflected in our philosophy and how we think about technology use across our schools and learning environments. Instead of thinking about technology as the thing, we talk about learning and we consider ways in which technology can enhance it. Purposeful integration of technology can engage different learning styles, promote critical thinking, support productivity, foster authentic work, like we saw with the uh, GLOBE students, and provide all students with a voice. Tonight, you'll hear from both me and Dr. Garganigo uh, because teaching and learning really helps provide much of the why for technology across our district. So we wanted to start first by sharing a couple um, just quick stories about purposeful integration of, of technology. So I have two stories, one an, element, an elementary story and a secondary one. Um, so the elementary story, if you can picture a first grade classroom, um, and this is pre-pandemic, uh, picturing a first grade classroom, the students and the teacher engaged in, in a shared reading as a class. Um, and at a certain point, the students all get an iPad, use a QR code to scan and get into Seesaw, which is an application that they can use to record themselves. Um, and they, the, they find a prompt from the teacher to respond to. They go off and sit in their little lockers to, res to respond to the prompt, um, articulating their own thinking and the teacher having access to, to all of their students thinking at, um, at, at one landing page. The students then coming back together as a class, discussing their thoughts and practicing listening to one another. And then after that discussion, students returning to Seesaw to record a second video, sharing how their thinking has changed as a consequence of the classroom conversation. So what does this highlight? Um, it's giving students time with their own thoughts prior to sharing with one another while also maintaining a longitudinal record of their learning and their thinking. The teacher can review that prior to conferring with the students um, and the student can see their own growth over time. The teacher can provide feedback to students individually on Seesaw and in a short amount of time, um, the teachers and the students have been able to capture two independent thoughts from all students um, and then that those independent thoughts can be used to influence instruction over the next several days uh, of the lesson. And then a secondary example is thinking about our eighth graders. Um, so our eighth graders participated in an Earth Day Summit. Uh, students worked on independent projects of interest to them under the umbrella topic of Earth Day. And within that summit, students' work is shared using many different types of presentation software. So Google Slides, Padlet, which is like an online interactive bulletin board where they can share videos and, and different links, original websites that the students have created or original videos that the students have created. And the students provide feedback to one another using a Google form or a Padlet. So they, and the teachers are providing feedback also. So again, what does this highlight for us? The ISTE standards that are really important to our work, one of those standards is called Knowledge Constructor. Um, and that standard states that students critically curate a variety of resources using digital tools to construct knowledge, produce creative artifacts, and make meaningful learning experiences for themselves and others. So students are able to research, create, critique, provide feedback to one another. And this all fits well within our um, strategic plan goal around personalized, individualized, and differentiated learning. So it can be a little challenging to remember what life was like before the pandemic, but there are definitely some highlights that we can share, uh, like the ones that uh, Dr. Garganigo was just talking about. One of the most visible shifts um, has been the move away from a technology model that was primarily based on small pods of computers stationary desktops um, that were within classrooms and toward a more flexible model 
uh, which takes advantage of the mobility offered by Chromebooks, iPads, laptops. Uh, this shift has really has more than tripled uh, the quantity of devices available to our students and has allowed technology to be used just about anywhere. Uh, this increased availability and mobility uh, has allowed students to select the right tool at the right time and has opened new doors for students to take and, and teachers to take advantage of technology in the classroom. Along the way, targeted professional development um, and learning activities have been provided to teachers across all schools and all levels. At Clayton High School, the plan also incorporated a one-to-one -one, uh, computing initiative, along with a supplemental internet hotspot program for those who needed it. The one-to-one -one plan was phased in over three years, allowing students to extend their technology access beyond the school campus. The district has also invested in the necessary infrastructure to ensure reliability, sustainability, and flexibility. Uh, this has included enhancements to internet connectivity, network equipment, data center services, and more, all within capital budget forecasts. More recently, the one-to-one -one program has extended into the middle and elementary schools as part of the district's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, something that would not have been possible without the fundamental shifts which had already occurred, had already occurred in the few years preceding. So when we think about our pandemic response as, as a district, um, Jeff and I have thought about this in sort of two phases, our emergency remote learning phase, which was essentially the spring of last year, and then our learn at home responsive learning phase, which are the different models that we've had during this school year. Uh, during the emergency remote learning, that required a very quick response um, to the need to continue to provide education to students while staff and students were in a shelter in place situation. When we think back to those times, uh, it was a monumental lift. Very quickly, we cataloged, tagged, and deployed close to 2,000 devices to students. We considered how to provide internet access to those families previously without it. We fundamentally changed our technology support program. We went from a system of supporting eight buildings with students and staff to supporting almost 3,000 buildings with students and staff and the same amount of personnel. Our educational technologists significantly shifted to side-by-side -side emergency professional learning and coaching to ensure that staff could deploy lessons to students using technology that might be new, different, or potentially challenging for them and providing this support through distanced means. And then we moved to the fall and our learn at home and responsive learning options. And we moved from an asynchronous expectation of learning to a synchronous one. Teachers were live with their students Expectations of lessons were to move forward with teaching new content. Many of the pieces put in place in the emergency remote learning, so things like the supports, the hotspots, the device deployment, the coaching, the professional learning, all of those things were continued. But in addition, we looked at access to online tools becoming much more robust. Technology and teaching, the technology and teaching and learning departments work together to provide tools to help the teaching and learning environment in the areas of access of information for students and teachers, students sharing their learning in different ways, and teachers presenting information in ways that, could, that students could access the information in the best way. And finally, as some students move back to in-person learning, the district continued to provide a remote option for families who chose it. Another complexity added into this phase was concurrent teaching. So to address absences due to illness or quarantine, again, we deployed toolkits, including iPads, microphones, and headphones to all secondary classrooms and to each elementary school for teachers to live stream their classes to students at home while simultaneously teaching students in a room with them. So what have we learned from the pandemic? So if we look for a silver lining in the pandemic, uh, when we're in classrooms now, we see our original vision of the technology toolkit, toolkit being enacted in classes. Students and staff alike are using technology in purposeful ways to expand the walls of the classroom, to allow students to share their learning in more creative ways and feedback to students and among students is more efficient and prevalent. The situation of the pandemic created opportunities for integration of technology and curriculum for all staff and students. We're independent of this situation, our rollout might have been slower or more measured. We've been impressed with how teachers and students alike have embraced the use of technology to enhance their teaching and learning. The need, 
uh, to use technology as a primary delivery tool for instruction has also allowed us to pursue some of the ways to use the tools to enhance how teachers can present content to their students. This was always on our docket as a next step. Um, we just accelerated the pace in some instances in order to address some of the identified needs. So while some of the challenges that um, Elena mentioned have been pretty substantial, uh, the district's technology response to the pandemic has been an opportunity to grow and learn. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the technology services team primarily supported our staff and student population across our eight buildings, as Melina said, but that need quickly shifted, uh, requiring the same team to support staff and students in their homes, uh, literally thousands of unique environments with different connectivity uh, all at once. As a result, the technology team uh, implemented new strategies to provide more remote support to engage and communicate with our students and their families uh, in new ways to provide internet connectivity for those in need and to find new methods of leveraging and capitalizing on the district's existing resources. So as we consider next steps related to the technology self-study, we will plan to incorporate the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic while also building on the foundation we've already established. Uh, we will continue to look for ways to experiment, innovate and improve. Uh, and we'll follow through with the remaining phases of the self-study in anticipation of bringing our findings and our goals back to the Board of Education next year. So with that, uh, Dr. Garganito and I are happy to respond to um, or record any clarifying questions you might have to help guide our future work. And will you guys just stop sharing your screen because it's just easier when we do questions to, but yeah, thanks. Um, so thank you both Jeff and Melena. Uh, I'm just gonna go around and see if the board has questions. So um, Stacy, you're first on my screen. So got any questions? I don't have questions, but thank you for everything you did in this, not only this presentation, but for our students throughout this whole pandemic. I don't think um, we would have been as successful with educating our kids without it. And I was happy to see that we're continuing the one-to-one -one devices for our students next year. Because I think, um, you know, for many reasons, I think it's important to continue that. I think we've seen the benefits of having that accessibility for all of our kids K through 12. So um, before I read the report, that was going to be my question. And then I was happy to see that in there. So thank you for continuing that throughout next school year too. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, Gary, any questions or comments? So um, thanks, Joe. Um, I, I also really appreciated hearing this update. A couple things about it that um, I really liked. Um, one, um, that we're not focusing on things like types of devices or numbers or just budgets or things like that, but really how this fits into our overall um, you know, objectives and plans and, and how this fits, how technology fits within the greater context of other things that we talk about. So um, I really like that focus and appreciate being able to have that context. I guess if I had a question for you, um, it would be um, if if we if we rolled the clock back to the the beginning of your your uh, your your self study period here pre pandemic, knowing what you know now and what you've been through over the last year, what things would you be looking at differently, or what questions would you be asking that you might not have thought of? back then and that might that if that that can be taken as rhetorical if you're not prepared to answer it's just uh, well that's one that uh i don't know Melaine, if you would say anything but for me listening to it's kind of thinking back to that um i think it's less about how what we might have done differently and more about the um the the ability to to pivot um and use the things that we'd been doing differently. <laughs> and so I think uh, looking back on that, I think it does teach us that this idea of being flexible and trying to think about resources kind of as a fleet, like as a, like it's sort of impersonal to think about it that way, but like, you know, you have this many iPads and you have this many Chromebooks or whatever, and that you have a need. And so what, how do we kind of throw that out, out, out there and say, how are we gonna fit this, this need? And I would say that I think that that exercise in itself is something that was was not totally new, but it was new on that scale. And so I think it was a. Uh, it, it's hard to answer what we might have when wondering or what questions we might have asked beforehand. 
but I think it's important that we reflect on how we react, responded to that so that we can put that to use for the future. So I don't know, I don't know if you'd add anything, Melina, but that's a little, that was a good one, Gary, but, uh, but it's a little bit tough to, for me at least to, to kind of look at it from that angle. Right. I'd, I don't know that I would look at it necessarily as the questions that we were going to ask. One thing that I feel like in, in responding to the pandemic that, that became really clear to us was that we were really driven in the initial rollout of the toolkit of making sure that, and Jeff talked about this, the right device at the right time, um, and, and like a variety of devices and access for students and everything, that all of those decisions that we made in the initial toolkit allowed us to to deploy devices, um, get things into students' hands for this pandemic that we wouldn't, like I think about it now and I think we wouldn't have been able to respond um, the way we, we did if we had not made those decisions before. And all of those were driven by curriculum and teaching and learning and, and that idea of, of like to your point, Gary, of it wasn't about numbers and it wasn't about those, but it was really about what we wanted um, education to look like with a with that deliberate connection, um, and so I, I'm really proud of that piece. So I don't know that it changes. It's, it's not really an answer to your question, but it's more about like what I think we're really proud of in being able to respond to this such an unusual situation. That's great. And I guess the the other thing that I would ask is in in light of all of what we've learned over the last year. Um, and, and before that too, because I'm appreciative of the fact that you're, you're thinking about these things all the time, at least in the cycles, is there, um, is, are there differences in the, in the support or the resources or the things that you think we need to be thinking about and planning for in this area? And that may come at the end of your self-study process, but um, are there other things right now that we should be thinking about in that, that regard? I think you, you have uh, articulated well that some of that will come at the end of the two year you know, study where we would be making recommendations for larger scale changes, but we've continually incrementally made changes along the way too. And so we're trying to be responsive to, um, to needs as they arise and really be actively seeking those things out. So sort of a both, uh, you know, look at the end of the study, but that hasn't stopped us for the last few years, of course, making incremental changes along the way. Right. And then the last comment I'll make is like, I think we need to factor into our technology plan the fact that um, these Zoom meetings, it's getting dark around me and we need to have some, some light. I can hardly see myself on the screen. So I'm going to go turn on another light. So be right back. Thanks, Gary. Uh, David, any comments or questions? Um, yeah, uh, one of each. So thank you for uh, pulling that together. I appreciate it. Um, I think, you know, kind of an easy one just as it's more of an observation because I think it's early days yet in, in, in defining the structure of the self-study, but uh, it'll be a recurring theme in, in any, any of these that I, I raise a question on. Please be sure that we also have some KPIs in each of your objectives. So at the end of the study, we can, we can kind of measure both qualitatively and quantitatively the, the progress toward goals. Um, you know, all too often we finish something and we say, well, you know, we actually, we did really well, but it's always nice to be able to identify data points that we can have uh, measurable progress on along the way and at the conclusion of the effort. Um, you know, my second piece is kind of a question and it's, it's kind of twofold. One is, you know, do we, do we do peer analysis, you know, where we are relative to, you know, our peer group in the, in the region and then second to that, and, and I think Gary almost touched on it a little bit too, is there a district, you know, elsewhere within the country that would be like the unicorn, right? The, the perfect district of, of progress that we can look to as a, as a yardstick to measure against and maybe strive for, even if it's not necessarily something that we would be able to hit in a five-year run. But is there, uh, you know, have you factored in those two pieces, both the pure side and then the, you know, kind of like the, the nirvana goal state um, that, that we can look to as, a, as somebody to, you know, kind of help with? Well, I can, I can uh, give you a brief answer on that right now, which part of our study is to do that. So we'll be looking at, um, we'll be looking at it, other districts just for uh, comparison's sake about um, and, and a number of things. So whether that is the methodologies that they use for 
delivering uh, content to the types and, of, and quantities of devices that they have. Things like that, we'll be doing some sort of like comparison there um, just to get a sense of, of where we fit in. Um, but another piece of that is to um, tap into some of the resources that we already have and some of the context that we already have. So we've got, um, I wouldn't say there's a unicorn district that comes to mind for me right now, but that is something that we'd be looking for. And I really think that it's also that idea of like balancing uh, what other people are doing and this uh, against what what makes us Clayton and what we want to do with with the teaching and learning. Uh, and so I think, you know, Melina, you may want to add to that, but that idea of sort of balancing what we're seeing elsewhere with um, really innovating with what we're doing here uh, for our students in our setting. I, I would agree. And I would, in our previous self-study, we had um, one district that we visited in Minnesota that was really integral in helping us think through some of our um, our plan there. And I, I continue to use them as a, as a resource. So I think we would continue to use them. I, I don't know that I would describe them as a unicorn. Like I may have described them as a unicorn back then. I think they're very steady with um, with what they do now, and and they've always been helpful to us and very open in sharing information. So I think we would continue to use them. But I agree with Jeff that part of the study would be for us to explore other other districts. So can I add one thing to that? I, I think the other thing around looking at other districts that's important is that um, one of the things I'm proud of is that you said earlier is that we had, didn't focus on just what the device was going to be. And it was about the instruction and how that device was going to enhance instruction or enhance uh, understanding of content. And, and I think that we can also learn from districts that focused on the devices that I think we've done that, that we're proud to say they gave every student a certain device, but maybe didn't think about that way of like how it actually is, it's really more about the en enhancing the instruction. So like the right device at the right time. And so I, am, I, I think we've also learned that way too. Um, but I, I think that definitely being part of a st the study is visiting other places that could help us take it up a notch. Thanks. Thanks, David. Jason, any comments or questions? Uh, no, I think you all did an excellent job. I'm excited about the future. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's been an interesting year and uh, all the things that we thought we want it, we're actually in motion now, those things are actually happening. And the future is, is where I'm looking for. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing how we um, pivot and make this, you know, really like, like uh, Sean just explained, a part of our learning curriculum. So yeah, good job guys, I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Thanks Jason. Caitlin, any comments or questions? Yeah, just a quick clarifying question. I know you mentioned uh, like you distribute Chromebooks um, and like other laptops and iPads. Uh, what determines uh, like which students get what device? And uh, have you been looking into like whether, for example, younger students adapt better to tablets compared to laptops and vice versa? That's a great question. Yeah, we uh, we actually have done that. So one of the things that um, that Caitlin, you weren't around for uh, the last time we started kind of when we really broke away from the old model of like, we're going to have a pod of computers in every room. We really, instead of asking like, what kind of devices do you like? <laughs> um, we were looking at what do we want these devices to do? And so when we did that, that really helped to start to kind of clarify for us um, what the right kind of device might be for a group of students. And so for the younger students, some of the, th the feedback was that they really didn't need the keyboard. <laughs> they really needed to be able to have a, a display that they could swipe and touch and that sort of thing. But for older students, the keyboard sort of was more important. So that's just one example. Um, and so that has helped us sort of kind of narrow down um, where, where we think that those uh, tools make the most sense. And as a result of that, that has kind of really helped steer uh, the work. And so that kind of creates you know, uh, some help with our, our, our uh, professional learning uh, that we can focus on certain device types or tools or apps or whatever that might be present on one platform uh, with one group of teachers, for example, um, but then something different with a, an older group. So the way that it works right now is that our, our youngest students, our K through two students are using iPads and then our students grades three and up are using Chromebooks. 
Thanks, Caitlin. Amy, any comments or questions? Yes, yeah, so thank you for the report. It was great. Um, my question is, I, so I wonder if, I know that during the, the, the past year, maybe some kids have really excelled being online as opposed to being in the classroom. And if there's any consideration next year when we're, when we're back full time um, of, you know, some type of program whereby uh, kids who, who did really thrive are able to access the same technology that we've implemented this year um, to allow them to learn from home if, if the team would decide that would be a better fit. So we are currently exploring what um, that's going to look like for the for the fall and also exploring some some like longer term options. So independent of the pandemic, um, I, I think you're right, Amy, that there are some students and families that have um, determined that this is a good learning platform for their children. And so regardless of a pandemic or not, they might choose to, to want to continue with that. There is a law in the state of Missouri that says that that we as districts provide um, a virtual option for students. Currently that option is through, through MOCAP, through the state. And so I think what we're looking at is what are some ways that we can explore doing that more localized? Um, it, because the, the idea of a third party vendor with that may not be what those families are actually looking for. So we don't really have answers to it right now, but we're exploring it. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Kim, any comments or questions? Yeah, thank you guys for the report. Um, first, I mean, Jeff in particular, I wanna thank you and your uh, incredibly small but very capable IT staff for all the support that you've given to students and teachers and administrators for the, throughout the district this last year. Um, I know as a, not as a board member, but as a family, we've been on the receiving end of that support. And it's, um, it's just impressive what you guys do with uh, the resources that you have. Um, you know, I, I just echo kind of everything that everybody else has said. I think it's important to look at some of those, maybe not unicorns, but you, you've got the, you have the benefit of this kind of long tail. I was looking at the Gantt chart in the PDF document that you guys provided. Um, of what the study looks like. And if you have the opportunity to, you know, go and explore some of um, things that other schools are doing, even aside from the pandemic outside of the box, like I think of schools like, um, like, oh gosh, like Elon Musk's Ad Astra School, right? Which is um, a school that's totally student centric um, versus curriculum centric and how they're integrating technology. I mean, seeing if there's any learnings that we can take from um, schools like that, which are, you know, kind of a non-traditional school model, um, as, as you guys think about, again, not just considering, you know, how much money should we be spending on the next device and how long will it last and, you know, all of the, you know, depreciation and longevity issues around technology, but really what do we want technology to do? Looking at some of those alternatives that are out there, um, given some of the resources I think that we would certainly consider as a board deploying to help you to look at some of that stuff would be um, really could create some meaningful student experiences, you know, in the next three to five years beyond again, what, what you guys have learned in the pandemic. Cause I was reading the, uh, the summary report and um, you know, I know that you start with, you know, here were the recommendations that came out of 2017. When I think about 2017 and the lifetime of technology, it's like a whole generation of technology ago, right? Even, even be beyond the pandemic. Um, so these self studies take a couple of years, but two years from now is a long time in the world of technology. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited to get the updates from you periodically as you guys continue the self study. Cause I think that there, are, based on the pandemic and everything else, there will be generational changes to education and what um, technology means for education going forward. Thanks, Kim. Um, and I don't have any questions. Um, Jeff and Melena, nice job. Um, we are going to move on. Melena, you have the pleasure of having the next item, the next information item, the annual assessment report. So, Melena, you get to keep going. Great. Um, I also have two people joining me 
Uh, so I don't know if Chris has let them in yet, but Jen Selenrick, our literacy coordinator, and Angie Caracciolo, our math coordinator, are um, going to join me to, to help. Um, so I'll start with the presentation. And um, I wanted to start just by giving some background of the fact that this report uh, arguably is very different um, than the report from previous years. Um, so first of all, it's, it's really only focused on local academic testing. Um, and while in previous years, we've used the panorama data um, also to report out, um, that's not incorporated in this report right now because of timing of when we administered the panorama assessment. And so what we're thinking is that um, we will provide an update to you on that in a subsequent um, strategic plan update because we feel like it fits well with that work. Um, Tonight, I'm really just gonna give a quick overview of some data and information that was presented more in depth in the written report. Um, as I mentioned, Jen Selenrick and, and Angie Caracciolo are, meet, are joining me here. I want to publicly thank these two. Um, they have done a tremendous, uh, like huge lift, especially this year. Um, they've been great thinking partners for me, for the teachers. Um, they've helped us in rethinking our curriculum uh, during a pandemic. They've helped in providing professional learning um, to teachers. They've helped with data analysis um, and they've just carried a huge load. And so I publicly want to thank them um, for all of that work. So as we start to talk about this report, um, first I wanna give you a little bit of information about the state um, and sort of where we are with that. So just to provide some background, in the spring of 2020, we did not do any state testing. Um, due to COVID and the interruption to traditional schooling. Uh, third party vendors also canceled their testing. So this included things like ACT, Project Lead the Way, um, SAT. So these data that are traditionally in the assessment report um, are therefore absent this year. And so one of the things that you may have noticed in this report is that high school data feels a little absent um, in that report. I wanna address that also with this is that typically when I present this report, the high school data focuses on those things, state testing, ACT, SAT, AP, those kinds of things. Um, additionally, the state did not give us an annual performance report this year, um, partially because of the fact that we didn't have state testing data, um, also because we, the state was looking at attendance differently in the spring, et cetera. Um, students who were scheduled to graduate last spring uh, who did not complete EOCs uh, were exempt, and some current students will carry exemptions through their high school career. So if they took a course that, re that required an end of course exam, they may carry an exemption throughout their, their career as opposed to going back and, and testing them. So then that fast forward to this spring. So what is testing looking like um, for this spring at the state level? The state is requiring state assessments to be administered this spring and they're requiring them to be administered to all students on site. Um, what this will mean for us is that we will begin testing in April uh, and we will provide a special testing date for our learn at home students to come on campus for testing. Um, these data will not factor into the accountability, but will be used by the state to determine learning levels across the state, and they will, re be, re they will be reported, and with that, they will also report how the district, what the district learning options have looked like throughout the year. Um, so while the report does not have state data, we do have local assessment information to, to report. And the traditional uh, district assessment plan was adjusted in the spring of 2020 and then in the fall of 2021. So by the end of the fall semester, we had administered assessments in reading to all students kindergarten through sixth grade for new students and students previously enrolled in a reading support course in seventh and eighth grade. In math, by January, we had administered the NWEA to all students in grades one through eight. Uh, as stated in the report, it's difficult to compare these data to previous years as like for reading, the test was a different test than we had traditionally administered. And in math, it was given at a different time. Um, so I'm gonna address a little bit of how we can sort of compare them, but I wanna be careful in, in making the comparisons. So a couple things to highlight from the written report. Our students as readers. Overall, students are performing within the range that we would expect. Um, while it is a different screener assessment that we administered this year, data looked comparable to previous years. Uh, one of the things that we're required to do by law is to screen students for dyslexia um, in grades one through in kindergarten through third grade. 
So in grades one through three, initial screening identified 18% of the total population for further data collection. After follow-up, more in-depth testing, et cetera, about 8% of the, of the student population in grades one through three demonstrated characteristics of dyslexia. The previous year, that was about 11% of the total population. These students are all currently receiving additional instruction in the areas of reading and will be retested in the spring. Kindergarten is tested separately. Um, this year, 24% were identified on the initial screener as needing more data collection. 12% were then identified as demonstrating characteristics of dyslexia. Last year, that was 11%. Overall, with our reading data, generally speaking, the total population percentage of students meeting benchmarks was in about the 80% range. So how does this compare to last year? So last year, we used the scholastic reading inventory. Um, the overall student population who scored within the proficient or advanced range on that assessment was in the 70% range. Additionally, the percentages of students scoring in the below basic range on the SRI ranged from 17 to 5% with one outlier class, which was the second grade, but that was at 30%. On the fast bridge assessment that we, that's the new assessment that we've given this year, um, during the 2020-2021 school year, the students scoring in the high risk, so that's equivalent to the below basic range of the SRI, was between 2% and 6%. So it depended on grade level. While the report detailed several different population groups, because of our equity initiatives, I will mention that on the reading assessment, there continues to be a difference between the scores of our Black students and those of the total population. Uh, the mid 80% range for students in the total population are meeting benchmarks. For Black students, this is in the 60% range. Last year on the SRI, just to give a little comparative piece, the total population was in the mid 70% range. And for Black students, this was in the mid 30% range. Again, because it's a different assessment, these data are difficult to compare. But the assessment that we're currently using, in our opinion, is a better assessment at measuring reading comprehension than what we were previously using. So then our youngest learners as readers. Kindergarten and first grade are all assessed using a teacher's college benchmark assessment. These data are, com are comparable from last year to this year. Um, it's the same assessment that we gave both years. So our first grade data is comparable. Um, and our kindergarten data in January 2021 shows a higher percentage of students categorized as reading below grade level. We feel this is to be expected as we began the year in a remote learning situation for all students. And for kindergartners, this was generally their first experience with formal schooling. Our team has been working tremendously hard to identify reading challenges with individual students and address them in a timely manner. We have students receiving individual or small group instruction to help address foundational skills. We're eager to continue to track the data for students, as especially at the elementary level, learning has moved back to resembling what we are more accustomed to. So then I wanted to shift to our students as mathematicians. Um, NWA as a company has reported nationally that students were performing about five to 10 percentile below where expected. This is generally also true for our population of Clayton students. Overall students' performance on the winter assessment was close to what we would generally expect to see in the fall. That being said, our total population continues to score higher than the national norm in each grade level. And in all grade levels, there was growth from the fall of 2019 to the winter of 2021. So our students are showing growth. To get a little more in detail, the average winter score for students in grades three, five, six, and seven fell within the five percentile when compared to previous court uh, cohorts. In grade eight, winter scores did not indicate any change, meaning that they're almost identical to previous cohorts. And in grade four, students' winter data fell outside of that expected five to 10 percentile range. They were more within about 20 percentile. We suspect that this is due to how the curriculum was rearranged in response to the pandemic, and specifically how fractional concepts were moved out of third grade last year and instruction on fractions began after our administration of the NWA. We will pay close attention to this cohort in the spring when we reassess. On the NWA, there's also a difference between the scores of the total population and our black students. But one thing to celebrate is that there are three grade levels where the growth of the scores of our black students exceeds the growth of the total population. Teacher teams are relying more on shorter classroom assessments to identify learning needs and respond to them quickly. 
Teachers are working with the math teams in each elementary school to provide targeted instruction. So our next steps. We're eager to give our district assessments again in the spring, closer to the end of the year to again analyze growth. These data will help us to plan for curriculum writing in the summer and start the fall with a more clear picture of the learning needs of our students. So Joe, I think we're ready for questions. Okay, great. Um, so um, Kim, any comments or questions? Yeah, so thank you for the report. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to get the baseline data that you use to develop the report. Um, I guess I think the report is good, but it's hard for me to be able to kind of statistically assess um, where each of the groups, subgroups, or even the district as a whole is compared to uh, the same student cohorts a year ago, or even the national norms or averages. Um, so for me, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a numbers person um, and having the raw data would actually be really beneficial. Okay. Kim, I'm, hi Kim, I'm gonna jump in. Um, I'm Angela, I'm the math coordinator. I'm not sure that, that, we've, that I've met all of you personally, but thank you for having us this evening. Um, I, I will point out one of the things when we're looking at the raw data that I think is important, particularly with the math with NWA, um, is when we, we typically don't give it in the winter um, for all of our students for a couple of reasons, right? The NWA assesses students on four goal areas. Um, and so that overall RIT score can sometimes be skewed and not give an accurate representation of where our students are. Um, because by winter, we've typically only addressed two of the four goal areas, um, okay. which is why I'm really kind of one of some of the things we looked at specifically with the teams was student growth in the areas of numbers and operations, um, because that's where the primary instruction has happened up to this fall. Um, so it's one of the reasons we don't typically send home the overall RIT score to families. We don't typically actually look at that um, as classroom teachers, because it gives us an unclear and maybe an unbalanced picture of our students as learners. Um, so while we'll be happy to give you that data, I think knowing that the overall score is probably not a good indicator to measure in subsequent years. Um, another thing to consider with NWA this year is that they renormed the study um, to make things even a little bit more tricky for us in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so the norms, um, meaning the percentile rankings from previous years have shifted a bit to compare to the percentile rankings for this year. Um, so as if the waters weren't muddy enough for us to try to compare this data um, that also occurred within this, this component. So just wanted to put that out there um, to be transparent with the numbers we're looking at. Okay, great. So Kim, what we can do is we can take the, the charts and things that we used and I can push them out to you. And then if you have questions on them, we would be happy to sit down and, and talk through them okay. with you. Thanks, Kim. Um, Jason, any uh, comments or questions? No comments, no questions, good job. Thanks. Okay, thank, thanks, Jason. Caitlin, any comments or questions? No, not as of now. Thanks, Caitlin. Amy, any comments or questions? No, not right now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. David, any comments or questions? Um, just one question. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my mic flopped out there. The um, Since we're kind of, it seems like we're kind of rolling our own this year, because of the absence of the state level data, right? Are we going to use this going forward so that this year is not lost in data, you know, bit bucket forever? I, I think it's important that we can trend at least for a couple of years. So how are we going to reconcile when the state testing comes back in line and we've got this oddball year that's an outlier statistically? So is your question, are we going to continue to report the local data along, yeah, with, our, the, along with the state data? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I hate to ask that because it almost feels like an undue burden on the kids, but it's just we I want to make sure that we we have something to compare on a go forward. Right. So all of the assessments that that we uh, that are reported in this report are things that are traditionally fall within our assessment plan. Okay. We may have given them at different times of the year because of students transitioning back into school or something like that. But um, the the assessments are not different. And when we give them again in the spring, that's a typical um, like point for us to, to collect data. So those pieces um, I think are actually gonna be okay because they fall within that. It's, it's the piece that we're missing spring data from last year and fall data from this year that mm -hmm. feels a little bit different. 
Um, and then, but we would continue to report these data and then add on, add back in the state data. And then at the high school level, we did ad administer the PSAT and the SAT this year. I just don't have the data back yet. Um, so that also will, can factor into an upcoming report of some way. So then it feels like we're a little bit more aligned to what we would traditionally be doing. So does the baseline change then too? next year or will we or will we have consistency because you know i mean like we're seeing today you know to angie's point with when we move the goalposts around and it, it muddies the water it makes it difficult to draw causation or correlation between events well if we're gonna if we're gonna shift the baseline again next year we're kind of right back where we started with that challenge so is it I mean, I know we're, there's only so much we can do. I should have prefaced that. So I recognize that, but I'm just <laughs> making sure that we're, we're thinking through years, you know, two, three, and four, or, you know, to right. some degree. Yeah, right. David, and I, I apologize if I threw you off there. I think one of the, um, having this conversation with you here today is, is probably challenging for us because we don't think we have a full story to tell you at this point is kind yeah. of maybe no, probably what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I can, we can prevent, present you with numbers, I don't think they're going to tell the full story because we had, um, you know, a, a stay at home, we had summer, we had virtual, we had, you know, like Sean mentioned again, and a new first day of school again today. Um, so by spring, I think we'll have better data to compare with our baseline historically of where our kiddos are kind of falling within the realm of previous cohorts and again in the fall. Um, so I don't think we have to, I, I, my intent is not to change the bar <laughs> or mm -hmm. hold different expectations. Mm -hmm. It's just to say right now where, where our kids are, we, we wanted to get data on our students so that we could do kind of a temperature read, right? Like where is everybody at? Are there certain cohorts we need to pay more attention to? Are there, are there kiddos we need to kind of, you know, pay more, more closer attention to, which we would typically have that information and we didn't. Um, but, but I think we'll be able to give you that fuller, that, that complete story moving forward. I, I also yeah. think that um, our, uh, you know, we have longitudinal data profiles on, on all students, on groups of students, et cetera, that I, I feel like these data that we're reporting on today are kind of the ones that we're going to have the star by, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to shifting the benchmark. Um, I, I think the benchmark stays where it has traditionally stayed, like Angie was saying, but these ones will always have sort of that asterisk by it. Yeah. And that would, that would make sense. Cause I, I mean, I think there's not going to be any mystery, right? We're all going to look back at this and recognize that that, that we're going to have these 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 almost outliers in data from this year. So I, I don't think there's a surprise there. So I I like that we're not adjusting anything and we're going to acknowledge the outlier. I think that's I, I would agree that's the right approach. Um, so I guess I only have one other question, um, and I and I apologize if you said it and I missed it. When's the panoramic data going to come out? Because I think that's uh, but it, to be honest, and I guess let me preface this by saying I, I know I've been very, you know, uh, hard with with Dr. Doherty on on student performance and student progress and testing and you know four days of instruction versus uh, you know two days of instruction. So don't get me wrong, I'm I'm not trying to 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 sidestep academic success, but I think what probably keeps me up at night is panoramic. Yeah. Um, so we are currently in still in the window of administering that assessment. We're almost complete um, with it with the administration of it. And so when Dr. Weens and I talked about ways to move forward with how to present that information to you, we felt like we have these strategic plan updates coming up. Um, that that's probably a good place for us to to put um, like a focus on the panorama data um, once we're able to sort of cull through it uh, once we close the window. Okay. Yeah, so you'll definitely get that data before the end of the year. And we, and like Melina said, that's going to be part of the, that series that we're doing on the strategic plan updates with the, um, um, the charts that we are, are comparables. So great. And guys, thank you for trying to pull together some semblance of a picture with imperfect <laughs> data. I know it's a, that's a bear. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Gary, any comments or questions? Melina, I hate to do this to you, but there was something that you um, said about um, some of the dyslexia numbers yeah. that I was just probably distracted and like only heard the last half of your sentence or something. I tried to find it in the report too. And can can you just maybe repeat that repeat. in terms of what we yeah what so we, what we found this year versus sure. Um, 
Hold on, let me find it. Ah, here we go. I'm sorry uh, to do No, this that's too. okay. It's, it's so with grades one through three, um, with the initial screening, we identified 18% um, who needed 18% of students who needed further like follow-up um, data collection. Uh, and from that, then uh, it was 8% that demonstrated characteristics of dyslexia. And the previous year, that was 11%. And then for kindergartners, it was 24% that were initially identified with the initial screener needing more data collection, and then 12% um, demonstrating characteristics of dyslexia. And last year, that was 11. OK, thank you. I'm sorry. I just was. No, that's OK. I, I just couldn't, couldn't mind it. Thanks, Gary. Um, Stacy, any comments or questions? Thanks. I have a few. OK, thank you, um, Melina and everybody. Um, so first, kind of, this kind of goes with what Gary was just asking. As a, as a board member, I like to think about how we can support you doing this work. So I first of all want to know, these students that are identified with dyslexia or are at that threshold of needing intervention, do you feel that we have the resources we need to address that? Like you said, we meet with them individually or in small groups. Do we have adequate reading specialists and materials and whatever we need to address those issues for those? I would, I'm gonna start by saying we have amazing reading specialists in our elementary schools. Um, and we've actually in the last few years increased that staffing. Um, at, so we now have two um, reading specialists in, in all three of our elementaries. And a lot of their focus right now is on um, students um, who, um, have characteristics of dyslexia. Um, it's a it's a piece of our reading program that we're trying to grow and get better and better at. Um, we've just we're looking at two specific um, programs um, to pilot next year. One is um, in the key stage one areas. Um, it's called Flyleaf. It's actually a resource more than a program. And then another program called SIPS. So we're growing our practice around dyslexia. I think we. Um, I'll be really honest, you ask an interventionist if she has enough time and she's always gonna say, I wish I had more. <laughs> Do you have any, enough resources? I wish I had more. And I think we're lucky to continue to grow that. I mean, I will have to say our reading specialist had kids in intervention or in small groups, like maybe day four of remote yeah. learning this year. It was amazing. Um, I think at the end of last year, we struggled with that a little bit, not because the reading specialists weren't there for the kids, but we were trying to figure out a day for a kid and not overwhelm them. So they hit the, I mean, they were like on it from the very beginning this year. Um, so Stacey, I appreciate the question. I mean, I think we, we can always, we always need more time. We always need more resources, but I do think that generally when we ask, we get it. Um, so we're, so right now we're just trying to figure out what's, what's best for our individual kids. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, and then Malena, um, a couple questions for you. I'm curious, how do the exemptions affect or will they affect our APR? No. And what does that mean? They won't, right? Right, no, so they'll, the, like those students who are exempt will just sort of end up with a star by them that it's a COVID exemption. Um, so that won't affect us at all. The, um, the spring testing this year, um, the what the state is looking at like they they are looking at um like completion rate so typically our completion rate has to be in the like 95 percent range um they have lowered that a little bit um to the 85 percent range but so um that piece i think is an important piece of this so like the the state is requiring us to do these assessments administer them on site um, but they've, the, the threshold has been lowered just a little bit. Well, that was actually my next question. If our learn at home students are required to come in person, right? For the MAP test. Correct. Do we know how many are still choosing not to do that? And are we going to hit the completion rate numbers that we need? So I'm, um, my office is actually putting out a letter this week to the learn at home families to explain this um, and to have them communicate with us and talk with us uh, about that. So I don't have the answer to the numbers right now, um, but we're looking at that. Okay. And my, just a final question. 
does the um, absence of high school data, how will that affect or not decisions going forward um, for next year? Decisions for? Um, like about curriculum or, you know, what we normally would use that data, how we would use it to guide us. Right. I, I think one of the things that um, I always try to say in the assessment report is that like the, the local data, the, so the things that we collect like at the classroom level are the things that, that have the most influence on us instructionally. Um, and what, what I think Angie and Jen in particular have done a really nice job with their teams with is like thinking about, so how do we collect um, more frequent, uh, like formative types of assessments, et cetera, to, to make determinations around curriculum. So I think even though there's an absence of like standardized big picture, like macro size data, there's not an absence of that, uh, of that stuff that really influences our instruction. Um, so moving forward, I'm not concerned about that. I do think that we're gonna have an increase in curriculum writing this summer across all disciplines um, because we've had to make some changes. Like that's just a part of this pandemic. We've had to make some changes to, to curriculum. And so that means that we need to do some writing to sort of recycle some things um, and think differently about where content is placed uh, in courses. The one other thing I, um, there was something else I was gonna say about the state. Oh, the state data, the 85% also, the state also extended the window. Um, so if a district doesn't meet that 85% by the, by the end of the spring, um, then they give you a fall window also to, to try to get to that. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Stacy, And um, thanks, Melena. And thanks, Jen. And thanks, Angie. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank so you. Thank you all. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to 5.03, which is uh, the enrollment projections. And this is Mary Jo. All right. All right. So there are two annual reports presented to the Board of Education on enrollment, um, the fall and the spring reports. So the fall report details the actual enrollment data based on the official count day, which is the last Wednesday in September, and compares that data to prior school years. The spring report provides a detailed history of projections by school, grade enrollment, and enrollment type, and um, does it for a five-year period. So historically, sorry, there we go. Uh, historically, projections have been based on live birth records and an analysis of 10 years of historical uh, resident enrollment information. Beginning with the 2017-2018 school year projections, a change was made in the base method, methodology for resident enrollment only. Because significant fluctuations in resident enrollment had occurred over three years prior to that school year, an analysis of three and five years of historic resident enrollment projections was performed and compared to the 10-year projections. The results of the analysis suggested that attrition rates for resident enrollment calculated using the cohort survival ratio methodology over a five-year period better represented the more recent upward trends we were experiencing at that time uh, than the 10-year calculations. So we continue to show the results of the three, five, and 10-year calculations in the reports, show trend lines based on them, and use those trend lines to help analyze the most accurate methodology. Um, board grant students, uh, which are students of children of our employees, and voluntary student transfer are both calculated based on attrition on the 10 year period of cohort survival methodology because it still works best for that group. Um, all other enrollment categories are just stepped forward according to grade progression. There isn't enough history to do a cohort survival on them or enough data. Um, for current placement, uh, consideration is given of available space in buildings and grade level under the district class size policy, which is IHB when we place non-resident students under the categories of board grant, statutory tuition, voluntary transfer student, and tuition, including both personal and tax credit. So as we look at all those categories of students, uh, we use the class size policy IHB. In addition, we use policy JECA, which provides established procedures on the order of the student placement um, and that they're enabled to come into the district 
against each different category and also includes priority of siblings of students. So when we look at the total enrollment projections for the 21-22 school year, uh, it's projected to be 2,515 students, which is a 0.6% decrease when compared to the September 2020 count day enrollment of 2,529. Uh, projections are beginning to trend at a decreasing overall enrollment, primarily due to the declining resident enrollment, as well as the voluntary student transfer enrollment, which is declining. So the total resident enrollment project projection for the 21-22 school year is 2,111 students, which is a 0.5% decrease compared to the September 2020 count day resident total enrollment of 2,121 students. Board grade enrollment is projected to increase next school year to 188 students, which is a 6.8% increase when compared to the September 2020 count day of 176. Personal tuition and tax credit enrollment is projected to increase five students for a total of 26 students combined or 23,000, I'm sorry, 23.81%. Statutory tuition enrollment is projected to remain flat at 22 students since there were no statutory students um, in the senior class. Voluntary student transfer enrollment is projected to fall to 168 students which is 11.1% decrease when compared to the September 2020 count day enrollment of 189 students. This is because there were 24 graduating seniors and we are also planning to accept five siblings of current students. So when we think about the current challenges related to the enrollment of the district, we will continue to monitor the current legislation, which includes House Bill 137 for charter schools, House Bill 349, which is voucher tax credit, and House Bills 303 and 543, which is open enrollment. And I know the board had an in-depth conversation with our legislators during the February 10th board meeting on all of these bills. And these bills are still being studied in the legislation. They have not been passed yet. We will continue to update the board on their impact to the district as legislative sessions uh, come to a close. We will also continue to monitor and staff for the large class sizes at Glen Ridge fifth grade, which will move into Wydown and the, CH, the current CHS 10th grade. Um, as previously mentioned, we will monitor cohort survival as we place non-resident students within our buildings to ensure we don't exceed cl uh, resident class sizes and just overall class size standards in future years. And finally, we, we always are striving to continue to maintain diversity within our schools and looking at options we have uh, to do that. So we will continue to monitor legislation that may impact our enrollment. We will continue to monitor shifts in resident enrollment, uh, current residential developments, as well as future uh, residential developments. The district administrators will monitor class size standards and available classroom space in existing buildings to accommodate projected fluctuations in resident enrollment. And we will give careful consideration uh, of projected class size growth, class size standards, and available classroom space when accepting and placing non-resident students. And finally, we will continue to provide the board updates in the fall um, on actual enrollment and in the spring on projected enrollment, as well as upstate updates of the status of residential developments and potential shifts in enrollment when we, uh, if something happens that we think is necessary outside of those parameters. So there is a summary of the 10 year history and our five years of projections. And uh, Joe, I guess if you have any questions. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um... Stacey, any comments or questions? Um, thanks, Mary Jo, and thanks especially for paying attention to the legislation because I, I do think that could affect some of this, especially our tuition students. Um, and so I appreciate you keeping an eye on that. Um, I just wanted to confirm, so if you're projecting that next year we will have more, an increase in personal tuition students and board grant students, um, I just want to confirm, we only accept them on a space basis, though, correct? Like there not has to be board. I mean, not yeah, board, not for personal board. tuition. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So right now we, we are, we do have a couple areas where we uh, feel that we can take them. Um, but uh, based on the legislation is when we'll make the final decision is whether or not we will. Okay. So that's just project, projection. It's not kids that have already, we've already approved. Okay. Yeah, not the five additional, so. Stacey, when you're talking about board grant, we do look at numbers across the whole district. So like if we're placing student, new students, we would look at the class sizes at each of the schools. And so it's not necessarily that they'll get the first choice. Okay, 
So that right. so if it's sense. an elementary student, you'd look at which grade in which school has the least right. amount. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And it's kind of like I mentioned, in all areas, we try to make sure we keep siblings together if possible. Right. So. Thanks, Stacy. Gary, any comments or questions? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Amy, any comments or questions? Just one question. I appreciate, uh, Mary Jo, that you, um, at, the, at the end of the presentation, you mentioned diversity and how you're continuing to look at options to maintain diversity. Um, so what are we, can you, can I just, can you give a little bit more information on that? We'll probably divert to Sean for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's different ways. I mean, we have um, looked at not only just like what we're doing in the district, but I think also what's happening within the city of Clayton. So like working with the city equity commission in terms of looking at, um, you know, the, the population of uh, the, the, our diverse population within Clayton, what do we, what can we do to make sure that there's a sense of belonging? You know, what are the reasons why people aren't choosing Clayton or they are choosing Clayton? And so um, when we're thinking about ways that, you know, th the mechanisms that the district can control, we can look at different types of partnerships um, that we can establish. But, um, you know, there's, we are limited in terms of what, what we can do. Um, I know that with the decrease of uh, the voluntary transfer students, there are there is the question of like if not the voluntary transfer program then what else could we do, and so we 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 have started those types of conversations about what what different partnerships could look like, so um, nothing has been set in stone yet, and and the other thing too is you know depending upon which way legislation goes that could also influence um, diversity within our district. Right, that's great. I appreciate that you guys are have that on your radar and that you're. Um, making some steps, taking steps to um, see what we can do about that. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, Caitlin, any comments or questions? No. Thanks, Caitlin. Jason, any comments or questions? Um, yeah, question, question for you. So, so some of our potential threats are coming by way of legislation, correct? Do we have an analysis of how many residents in Clayton go to private school? Do we have any like any information on that? A, a roundabout figure, a number? I think when the last demographic study we had based on the results, and I think even based, it was consistent with the prior one we had, it's about 20% of the Clayton population. It's pretty big. It's a pretty large number. So I guess my question is, is how do we, because that's a, that's a threat that private schools are able to poach from our community, 20% of the students and families that, you know, that live here. How do we compete with that? 20% is a lot of people. Sean, how, how do we yeah, compete? I don't really have the answer to that. I mean, I think that what we can do is continue to pro pro provide, you know, a really high quality education. There's different reasons why people choose to do um, private school versus um, public school. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, when we've had people who have been in our district and wanted to tour our schools and see the comparables of comparing their, their, the private school to the public school, I, I mean, I've seen firsthand people say, yeah, you know, Clayton is like a private school environment in a public school setting. Um, so I can't speak to why certain people will take, you know, do private school over the public school, but, um, you know, we're always constantly looking at making sure we have the highest quality program. I think that this past year, I know that there's been some people who made some choices because of the learning model um, around COVID. And I mean, I don't know if that, I don't, we don't, we don't have data in terms of how much people have pulled out of the district. We have that data in terms of people pulling out of the district for the learning model, but um, I've had people who said they're gonna move back into the district after this year. So yeah, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the factors are. I can't answer that, but um, 
you know, we're always constantly we're wanting to make sure that we're providing the highest quality experience that people want to come into Clayton. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, that honest answer. I'm just thinking about, you know, we should do a survey. I, oh, number one, I shouldn't say we should. Let me, let, me, let me back that up. I hate when people say you should, we should. Have we thought about doing a survey uh, and, um, and to find out why people are choosing private school. I know some of them is legacy, it's this, that, and the other, but I'm saying, can we find out some of those reasons and try to figure out if we can, um, if we can, you know, knock off a few of those and try to, and, and you know, compete in those spaces where we're losing, you know, those students. Cause they could be the same commentary from a lot of, a lot of families as to why their children, 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 are leaving or why their families are choosing a private school. If there's some way we can knock off that attrition from the community and we can increase our numbers, um, increase our numbers in, in Clayton. So have you thought about that doing the survey? Well, yeah, I mean, we do put a community survey out. I don't know if we, ha if we have the ability and I'll have to ask Chris about that in terms of how we actually can target those people who ha have their students in private school. I don't know if we would be able to do that, but um, no, I mean, we can think of different ways to get that information, like why choose private over public, but I, I'd have to think about the best mechanism for us to get that data. And, and the other thing I will say is we definitely saw, I mean, the economy drives a lot of it. So back in 08, 09, um, that's when we started seeing increases in resident enrollment because the economy was driving people back into public school. Um, and so, and, and, and Chris is getting on, I mean, he will mention ours is actually lower than Ladue. Um, he was saying like Ladue is more like at a 40% rate. Um, Correct. Correct. So we, we, so when we talk about that, we talk about it as our capture rate and, and I apologize. I mean, we have a ton of construction work going on in the house, so I don't really have a good place to to, to sit and, and, and be on camera. Um, but we, we talk about that as our capture rate. And um, as, as, a, as a public school district, we have one of the highest capture rates in the metropolitan area. Um, there are other school districts um, who shall remain unnamed, but are generally put on the same list as we are, um, who tend to see in, in the high 30s or low 40s in, in terms of percentages of students actually going to private schools. You know, we've always been in the in, in in my 20 plus years here in the district in the low um low to mid 80s you know in terms of in terms of our capture rate and um you know when we do survey people on those public opinion surveys one of the questions we've asked for our last three or four survey cycles is you know how do you rate clayton schools compared to other area private schools and we consistently consistently see that number um, in the, you know, high 60s, low 70s, you know, ranking our schools as good, if not better than area private school options. Right. So what, what does capture rate mean again? What does it mean in this? Capture rate is, so if you, capture rate is, is the percentage of total school age children that you actually have attending your public schools. Okay. That's just the term that we've always used. In your used. district, right? Correct. Right. Gotcha. And you said we're at 80, we're at 80 percent capture rate? And which, is, which, is extreme, which is extremely high for a public school. Gotcha. gotcha. So, I mean, if, if you consider statistically only about a third of the families living in our school district actually have school age children. And that's also a number that's been very consistent across, um, you know, throughout my time here in the district. Uh, so about two thirds of the folks living in Clayton do not have school age children. So those that that kind of puts all of those, you know, large numbers in perspective. Right, but but twenty percent is still kind of high for a small district, though, right? Like thirty percent for, like, say, Ladue, which is huge compared to Clayton. Um, you know, I think I think the percentage. I think that's a number where you really look at the at the percentage per se in in terms of, of that. I mean, when we do when we do do exit surveys and talk with families who are, you know, leaving the district to choose to private, to go to private school. I mean, this was, this is of course pre pandemic, but you know, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the feedback we get from some of those families are that, you know, well, they're, you know, a second or third generation 
kid that went to St. Louis University High, or they're leaving to go for a uh, for religious high school type education. So, I mean, there's those are there are families that are going to make those types of choices regardless of you know what their resident school district is. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to make this statement one last statement. I'll let you all roll on, but I just want to make this point. Now, I think we need to be competing in that space. Like 20%, you're right, is the norm. Uh, but for someone like myself who doesn't, I don't know this space very well. This is my first term going to my second. I'm thinking I would like to see, you know, that number down to 10%. I want to be able to get more students from the district into our schools as opposed to the opposite. I know other districts are, you know, have a higher rate, a, a more inferior capture rate. But I mean, those districts are way different than ours. You know what I'm saying? And uh, if we are like a private school, we need to be operating like one. You know, to me, I, it would seem like we would need to be uh, marketing, uh, actively and deliberately going after these families in the, in the district, um, and, and and you know, proving that we are capable of, of educating their children and putting them into the spaces they need to be in the future for success. So that's that's all I'm thinking about. And, and then, oh, and. To Amy's point, you know, it is interesting. I know that the city is working on its um, uh, diversity plan, but I mean, it seems like now we're putting the ball back and forth a little bit. You know, you know, we need to look at the, what the city is doing back to what we are going to do. I mean, you know, it's just interesting because in, in a minute, there's going to be no more VTS. In a minute, statutory tuition is gonna statutory kids will be out, you know, out the door. And then we're you know, then we're just twiddling our thumbs trying to figure out what we're gonna do. And maybe, maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe it's, maybe maybe that is kind of like the thing that's gonna happen. You can't stop it, but it's just interesting. No, I, I don't I don't think that we're punting. Like I wouldn't say that it's like now, well, that's your problem. I think what we have to do is look at it two different ways. Like you have to look at the systems way, like what's the insular way of being able to do that, and then what different strategies that you can do to promote diversity or increase diversity. And so I think it's an and, not just or. So I think that there's there's different ways to look at it, but I, I would agree with you. It's I think it's I think it's something that we do have to consider and um, and think about for the future. I, I definitely do. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it, Sean. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Kim, can I, any comments? Can I respond Kim? to Jason really quick? Really quick, but then I want to go to Kim and David because they don't have their voice in yet. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to respond to the, the capture rate talk. There's another way of looking at this. It might be just to play devil's advocate, good for our ego to think 100% of the kids in Clayton and families wanna to come to our schools, but let's not forget, they're all still paying taxes and supporting us that way. And yet we don't have to overcrowd class sizes and hire more teachers to educate them. So there is a financial incentive <laughs> advantage to maybe not trying to get everyone in our schools. I just wanted to point out the other side of that argument. That's all. Thanks, Stacey. Kim, any comments or questions? No, thank you. Thanks, Kim. David, any comments or questions? No, thank you. Great, thanks. And I, I don't have any comments or questions. Uh, thanks, Mary Jo. Nice job. Um, so we are moving on to, we actually have a study item also, and this is uh, Tony. It's uh, the staffing recommendations for the 2021-2022 school year. Good evening. So tonight I am coming to the board regarding our staff needs for the upcoming 2021-22 school year. Each year we have meetings with building administrators to review staffing requests. As we look at the various requests, we deeply analyze them by reviewing those enrollment numbers, determining best ways to support student learning, and other specific needs to make our recommendations that we believe are essential. So we are recommending an increase for a full-time teacher in art at Clayton High School. This is to accommodate the increase in student interest and would enable us to offer additional art classes. The new block schedule being implemented next year will let our students take an additional half to full credit um, for the school year. Also, the popularity of the integrated art and design engineering courses is an example of the innovative options that we can offer our students with this addition. 
We believe that the staffing edition connects to our strategic plan the following ways. Students will have multiple pathways to authentic real world learning experiences that allow them to design and implement solutions to complex problems. Another connection is curricular design to promote personalized learning that provides students opportunities to have voice and choice in learning. Next, uh, for gifted, we are recommended that we add a 1.0 FTE teacher to be shared between Clayton High School and YDM. So several years ago, we had a model at Clayton High School that was um, uh, eliminated, and we're excited because this new model is really an innovative approach to our students at Clayton High School that are identified as gifted to receive services. The team of secondary gifted teachers would provide exploratorium and individual support for underachieving gifted students. Additionally, the team would provide support to classroom teachers through coaching and co-planning to better differentiate within the classroom setting. So when possible, as schedules allow, the secondary team could also support enrichment in the elementary grades. This request is connected to our strategic plan because it allows for individualization. It allows for our students um, to ask their own questions, explore multiple solutions to complex issues, and also challenge the status quo. Additionally, it will allow our students to make anti-oppressive choices and use their gifts and talents to build a more inclusive community. Also, our choir program at Clayton High School, very excited that it's continuing to grow, and we want to celebrate that growth. In order to accommodate the increased uh, request of students wanting to take classes, we'll need to increase our current choir teacher by 0.2 FTE um, and offer five full-year courses instead of four full-year full courses. This will also accommodate our new history of black music course that will be offered to our students. This request is connected to our strategic plan because it will allow our students to see historically accurate representation where students' cultures are celebrated and reflected in curriculum materials. At Whiteown, we're requesting an additional 1.0 FT teacher for PE and health. This, is, uh, this need is coming from the new block schedule model being implemented at Whiteown for next school year. It will remove math from the team and add PE and health to team. So what this does actually, it will allow us an innovative approach to better individualize the varying math needs for our students. This will provide more flexibility with scheduling in math because the teachers and students will not be tied to their teams for math. This will also address some of the math classes that have historically been over the class standards, class size standards. And this model will provide students with more differentiation within the math curriculum across their grade levels for the needs of our students, including accelerated math. This request is connected to the strategic plan because it allows for more individualization built on students' needs. With all the recommendations, we will evaluate annually by reviewing our enrollment and other needs to take a close look and then determine if allocation remains a need. Overall, with these recommendations that I um, presented tonight, it would be an overall 1% increase to our salary budget. We have any questions? Thanks, Tony. Um, David, any comments or questions? Yeah, um, Tony. Thanks for the comprehensive rundown of of the request. Um, but I I am just a little curious because we just you're coming on the uh, the heels of a 11 percent decline in 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 student attendance. So <clears throat> when we look at adding staff like this how are you factoring in the, um, the projected enrollment numbers um, over the next, say, five, six, seven years to, you know, mitigate potential impact of having to cut ahead, you know, as opposed to stretching what we've got? Right. So we're basing the, the needs right now that we have on the current enrollment and the projections that we have for the courses that are being selected um, by the students at Clayton High School and then the projections at Wide Elm. Are you talking like beyond next year? What does this look like? Is that what you're asking, David? Yeah, yeah. Because I just, you know, I don't want to sit to see it. You know, we're we're you know right before this, we're having a lengthy conversation around systemic decline in, in attendance. So it makes me nervous if we talk about adding staff in the same breath as reducing attendance. So you know, I want to make sure that we're looking out beyond a planning horizon of one academic year or two academic years. David, can I just add that one of the things that we do, and, and we've seen this before at, at the board table, is that we go through all of the requests and look at the class sizes at every, every building every single year. And so we would look at the projections. Sometimes that means that we have to come forward with a decrease in staffing. So we have decreased staffing based off our numbers or based off our enrollment um, that we've had to make some really tough decisions. And so it's not that just because these are coming forward 
um, now, that doesn't mean that we we wouldn't decrease if we didn't have a, a de we wouldn't keep a teacher on if we didn't have the actual numbers. Um, and so sometimes that happens with attrition, but um, we wouldn't just you know take put on a, a staff and not reevaluate it if we if we didn't have the numbers to support it. No, I, Sean, I, I don't disagree. I'm not suggesting we would keep somebody on if we didn't have the students. What I'm asking is if we're looking on the academic year of 20, you know, 21, 22, so that, you know, we have an idea based on attendance track for choir, as an example, that we're not going to then turn around a year later and cut somebody from their job. That that's what I'm more yeah, concerned yeah, about. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that, you know, we, we constantly are trying to compare our staffing with our enrollments. And, and we do see that there are decreases in the enrollment. And we do know that there's going to be some areas that we're going to have to take a look at. But with these that we are recommending, part of them is that it's new innovations and new things that we want to try that we are going to have to reevaluate and see whether or not we have, you know, we're getting the dividends that we want to have. Um, but I, I do hear what you're saying is that looking long term. Thanks, David. Uh, Kim, any comments or questions? No, oh, just the, I kind of echo the same thing that David said. I mean, it sounds like there's the demand for these classes and these courses now, but at some point, if we have a kind of a steady decline in enrollment, um, you know, maybe easier to not this year, but maybe next year, um, think about pausing on the hiring until we know what the medium and longer term staffing needs look like. So you don't have to make the decisions to cut staff. It's easy to add, it's hard to cut. Right, yeah. to Amy's point though, even if we lose 10, 10 to 15 children, the, <laughs> we're still getting the money no matter what, right? It doesn't really, doesn't really uh, affect our costs. Like, Am I right? Am I thinking about this wrong, Kim? Well, they may not necessarily be going to a private school. You know, the family may be leaving town. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's right. Know. That's true. That's right. Yeah, good point. good point. All right. All right. Sorry about that, guys. No problem. So, Jason, just while we're on you, any, do you have any comments or questions? No. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was, that was uh, Trading Places, Eddie Murphy throwback. Sorry. <laughs> no. Nice. Thanks. Caitlin, how about you? Any comments or questions? <clears throat> no. Thank you. Amy, any comments or questions? So I just will uh, thank you for the, for the report. And you guys are the ones that are in the trenches every day. And I, I trust that when you ask for a new teacher that, um, or some, a new staff member, that that's what you guys need. And I will support you guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Gary, any comments or questions? No, I guess I would just, um, I was just uh, looking through the summer here. When, when would this become, um, this isn't a request to, to have this approved right now. When would that, what would the timing of that look like if we were to approve this? Right, so we were thinking about bringing it back for approval at the next board meeting. Okay. So, is that April 14th? Okay, so, so pretty quick. And the other thing, I just appreciate that you've um, looked at the specific areas and I like seeing a couple of uh, arts related um, faculty positions added or are in here. So um, I like to like to call that out, but so we'll be thinking about this in a more decision um, kind of mindset pretty quickly. So it's great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Stacy, any comments or questions? Um, thanks, Tony. So um, just because I've asked about this at previous meetings, I've been in the past concerned about the class sizes of some, especially math classes at Wydown. So bringing the math teachers off team, will that help create more sections and reduce our class sizes? Yeah, so I spoke with Jamie. I spoke with Jamie over at Wydown about this uh, in particular. So right now it looks like this would give us an approximate 31 sections of math um, that's needed, and then we would have um, really it would allow for more creativity too and some innovative approaches to some math classes. So that's the really exciting part by taking math off of team. It would actually 
it would actually be able to bring the mass classes down to a smaller size because some of them have been quite large just due to the restrictions that we have when math has been placed on team and with it being off of team it actually gives us a little bit more flexibility with being able to differentiate and um, having different teachers teach different levels so there could be a seventh grader in with some eighth graders in the math class depending if that's what their need is versus before it was um, strictly with those children on those students on that team okay Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, and, and Tony, I don't have any uh, comments or questions. Nice job, thank you. Um, so we are moving on to, we have a couple action items. So the first action item is actually um, Tony again. Uh, it's the second reading and adoption of policy GCL, the professional staff development. So Gary, do we have a motion? Yes, I move that the Board of Education approve policy GCL regarding professional staff development and, uh, sorry, staff development as submitted, sorry. Second. Kind of butchered that. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any comments or questions? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it passes unanimously, thanks. So we're moving on to 7.02, which is the approval of a license for the city of Clayton to use district property. 7.02, I move that the Board of Education grant a personal and revocable license to the city of Clayton for the use of a designated section of district property in Shaw Park for the construction of a playground subject to the terms and conditions set forth within the attached license agreement. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? All righty, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. It passes unanimously. So we are moving on to our cons consent agenda. 8.01, I move that the Board of Ed Education approve the consent agenda items 8.02 through 8.08. Second. So we moved and seconded for the consent agenda. Any comments or questions? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, it passes unanimously. Okay, we are moving on to the, whoops, let me keep going, to the, I think financials, right? Yes, 9.01, uh, the financials for February, 2021. Do we have a motion, Gary? Sorry about that. I, 9.01, I move that the Board of Education approve the payment of current expenditures and investments for February, 2021. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it passes unanimously. So we're now moving on to public comment. Do we have any public comment, uh, Sean and Chris? Uh, yes, we have one public comment this evening. Uh, it's from Marlene Victor. And she writes, superintendent response. I feel it is inappropriate and biasing for the superintendent to describe in the weekly newsletter proposed Missouri House education reform measures, that is school choice, as generally unfavorable to the district. This may be an opportunity for the district to increase enrollment in an, area of decline, in an era of declining enrollment. Plus, the schools appear to have the option to decline transfer applications. If the school district can't meet my needs or the needs of other parents, we should have the option to have our tuition dollars follow us to a school that can better meet our needs. This was a biasing statement presented to the entire Clayton community, reflecting the bias of the two Missouri legislators who are Democrat. Not everyone served by the district is Democrat or shares a Democratic ideology. And that is all. Okay, thanks, Chris. 
All right, so we're moving on to board communications. Uh, does anybody have a, uh, a board communication? Stacy? Thanks. So um, as you all know, I'm our representative on the governing council for special school district. And um, the way that special school district as a school district also has a board of education and the way that its members are elected are by the governing council. The governing council is one member from every school district in the county. So I was able to vote um, in this past school board election. Um, we elected three new members and the members of their school board each, uh, each represent a sub-district. We are part of a sub-district that includes Clayton, Normandy, Rittner, and U City. So um, there were actually three candidates running for the spot to represent our sub-district. And I'm proud to say that a Clayton parent was elected um, to represent our, our sub-district on the Board of Education for Special School District. Her name is Tiffany Hudson. And so I just wanna publicly congratulate her. And I'm again, proud that a Clayton parent will serve on that school board. Awesome, thanks Stacy. Anybody else have a, uh, a board uh, communication? I just have a quick one and it's um, from a couple, two or three weeks ago, there was a CRSWC meeting um, and they discussed, we discussed um, that while there was um, around a $700,000 deficit at the end of last year, um, it was estimated that it would be close to a million. So it was, it was not great news, but better than we expected. Um, and I think they anticipate the numbers to go up in, in the next couple of years. More members are starting to return and services are, are being resumed. That's it. Thank you, Amy. Any other board communication? Okay, uh, can we have a, uh, a motion to adjourn? I move that the Board of Education adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank